Hi everyone, welcome back to David's DIY Reviews. On this channel we do a lot of woodworking builds and little kind of tips, tricks, tutorials like this video here. So let's get into it, how to cut straight with a handsaw. So the first thing I'm going to say is definitely draw a line on your material. I mean, don't think you're just going to grab a saw and it's going to be fine. You're just going to cut it all it'll work out. Most likely it won't, unless you're really experienced with woodworking. Try to draw the line on at least two sides of your material if you can. If you, if you can, go all the way around, just using a T-square, a combination square, even a ruler to set it up. Draw your line all the way around, and at the very least, that's going to be a guide to cut straight. So the first thing you're going to want to do is kind of get your saw cut started. Get your kerf started. Now, it's kind of controversial how you do that. Some people like to push lightly forward. Personally, I like to pull back to get a saw started. I mean, if your saw is in really good shape, you should be able to push forward. Not all of my equipment is in perfect shape, so that's not the case. So you get that top cut started. And at this point, it's really important to remember that your first, you know, 5, 10, 15 saw strokes, that's going to set the course for your cut through the whole piece. At this point, uh, one technique a lot of people use is they'll get that top cut made, they'll reclamp their piece of material this way, and as you cut down through, that kerf you created will guide the saw. Uh, that's a way that I'll, I tend to use with like a thicker piece of wood. But if you're cutting a 2x4 or something like that, you can probably just keep it clamped in and start cutting through. So we'll go ahead and I'll show you how to do that. It's always important to remember too, the closer you cut to your clamping system, the less it's going to move and the better it's going to be. So we'll go ahead and we'll continue this cut. So what you want to do is you definitely want to keep an eye on your line as you go down. So we'll start cutting. And remember, always cut with the forward push of the saw. That's the way the teeth are going to work for most push saws. And if you find, oh, I'm, you know, I'm making my cut, it's starting to go off the line. All you need to do is kind of move your saw one way or the other, the, the handle of your saw, kind of push it to one side, push it to the other side, and that's going to that's gonna cause the, the saw blade to start to turn one way or the other, and you can get back online. And as you're making your cut, always try to keep your arm in line with your shoulder. Nice straight stroke. That's going to help make a straight cut as well. Keep an eye on the line and let the saw do the work. A lot of what is going to cause you to cut crooked is if you're trying to force the saw through the wood. Just let the saw do the work. Another thing I see sometimes also is, you know, people are cutting something, they get all the way to the end of the cut, and then they kind of, oh, I'm almost there, I'll just give her and forget to pay attention, and all of a sudden your line goes crooked. Make sure you're paying attention all the way to the end, following your line, and it'll be nice and straight. And I know sometimes even for beginners, you know, that method, it's easier said than done. Another good trick you can do is actually clamp a piece of wood right next to the line you're going to cut. And then you can actually just follow right along that. And that pretty much almost guarantees your cut is going to be perfect. And when in doubt, guys, if you happen to have a miter box, that is really a 100% guarantee that your saw is going to be straight. It allows your saw to be perfect every time. I've actually got a video in the YouTube card above which will explain to you really all the uses of a miter box, you know, what they're good for, what they're not good for. But at the end of the day, I use them all the time. I do a lot of woodworking at home with hand tools and a miter box is something I'm using every single day. It's really the best bet. And one last little bonus tip, if you find you're making a cut and you know, you're not very far through it, you don't want to do it again, you want to make sure this cut works, you're going offline, you can bring the saw up and actually hold the saw at both ends, bring it back up where you went offline and you can kind of start to just carve away at the side and kind of get it back online to where you need to be and then um, continue your cut like that. 
And if you happen to be looking for a good handsaw, check down in the description below. I've got uh, some links to some really good equipment, everything I use in this video. Also in the description below, David's DIY review merchandise, shirts, hats, masks, all that kind of great stuff. So one of the first things you're going to want to think about is the length of screw you're going to be using to screw two pieces of wood together. You want to make sure that the screw isn't going to stick past the end of the second piece of wood you're screwing to or whatever it is you're screwing into. So like this screw here would be a little bit too long. You probably want to go with, you know, something that almost goes through your second piece but not quite. And that's going to give a lot of good bite to hold them together. The next thing to think about is the screw itself. If you're, you know, screwing like a thicker piece of wood like this into another piece, you're going to want a screw that has a decent sized collar on the top or the shank. That's the part that doesn't have any threads on it, so that when you screw into the second piece, it allows to bite into the second piece, but it's not just spinning the threads in the first. If you have threads all the way top, sometimes what that causes is the pieces to spread apart. You might have run into this in the past. As you screw in, it will separate the pieces. Having a collar on the top like this that's blank, that'll allow it to tighten right up tight. And if you've run into the situation where when you screw two pieces together and they separate, Another way to prevent that is to drill a pilot hole in the first piece. And to do that, you just get a drill bit where the drill bit size is the same as the shank of the screw. So the diameter of the drill is the same as the smooth part of the drill. And then you drill into the first piece, and I'll show you how to do that now. So all we would do is just drill a pilot hole through the first piece like this. Line it up with your second piece and then drill through into it and that's going to help keep it nice and tight. So you could just kind of quickly deburr your first piece that you screwed. Grab your bit and you'll notice now when you screw it together that uh, it goes together nice and snug. So you start to separate but then it tightens right up. And that brings me to my next point. As I screwed this in, it didn't split the end but it just just barely started to split right there and I'll show you a, a really handy trick to prevent that from happening. If you're going to be screwing right near the end of a piece of wood or like a hardwood like this, this is maple, and you're worried about it splitting, what you can do is drill a hole not the size of the shank but you could drill a through hole that's the entire size of the threads or even slightly bigger than the threads of the screw. That way the screw will go clear through the first piece and just tighten up on the second one. So once again, we would just go ahead and drill the first piece, kind of offset it a little bit so you don't drill into your second one. And you could drill all the way through, and this is maple, so it's a little tougher to drill. Drill a, a clear hole all the way through. And then your screw isn't gonna crack the end of this at all. And what you may have saw just brings me to the next point. You may have noticed that as I was drilling that screw in, the bit slipped a little. You'll definitely be worth getting yourself a really good bit. And if you're ever drilling into something and the, the screw head starts to strip, you definitely want to remove that screw right away and use a new one because what will end up happening sometimes is the head of that screw will strip and strip and just as you almost get it all the way in, it'll strip at the point where you can't turn it anymore and then you'll be stuck with a screw stuck in your wood. If you're in Canada, you're going to see a lot of Robertson screws like this, a lot of Robertson head screws. Uh, this is a, a bigger black Robertson. These are the red Robertsons. In the States, you're going to see a lot of uh, Phillips and Torx and even flathead sometimes. Um, other places in the world, you're going to see a lot of Robertson, a lot of Torx. Definitely, you don't really want to go with Phillips. They're going to tend to strip out a lot. Another handy trick, if you wanted to screw, let's say, this 2x4 onto that 2x4, you don't really have any way to go better. You'd want to kind of put the screws in on an angle like this. And the easy way to do that is you can just take your drill bit and your drill and you can screw, or I should say drill, you just start drilling in a little bit like this, pull your drill bit out, and then you can kind of go on an angle like this, drill through, and that's going to allow your screw, when you screw it in, to go right 
into the piece of wood. I'll show you what I mean. So once you've got that hole drilled, deburr it a little bit, grab your screw, get it started in here. And then as you can see, that's gonna allow this screw to go right into that two by four like that. You could do two of them side by side and that makes a really strong joint. Once again, for a finished piece, you could countersink this hole and then it would be really flush and it would look just perfect. And if you wanted, you could pre-drill, you know, every hole and it, it's always gonna work perfect. For, for just two by fours or something like this, don't be afraid just to go ahead and drive your screws right in right off the bat. Just make sure you're pressing down really hard. Kind of go slow to start. You can slow the whole way, and that's gonna ensure that the screw goes in really well and really tight. If you happen to be screwing something together like this, just pay attention to when you screw in that you're not to one side or the other because that's gonna cause this to split out. You're definitely gonna wanna make sure that your screw is right centered in the middle. So that way when you screw it in, it doesn't split this out either way. So you just would line it up nice and good like that and screw it in. Just like that. And if any situation you find that when you put a screw in, it tightens up and then it starts to get loose, that means it's stripped out in the bottom piece. You're going to want to remove that and move your screw over and get a fresh bite in a different spot. Otherwise your pieces aren't going to stay together. And for a really, really tight, solid, you know, permanent connection, definitely think about gluing and screwing together. And that's going to be, you know, kind of the ultimate joint that you're ever going to have. So the first and probably most important thing about gluing boards edge to edge is to have the edge of the board perfectly flat and square. And you're going to want to make sure that the edges are 90 degree to the face. And for shorter boards like this, you could probably get away with a table saw or just buying flat stock. But for longer boards, you're probably going to want to use a jointer or maybe set up a, a jointing system on your table saw. But for small kind of DIY like this, you can probably just run them through a rip saw or like I said, buy straight flat stock and it's going to be good enough. Another thing to think about is composing your board. That, that is, um, you know, matching the grain up. If you're going to be staining the wood, you're going to want to match the grain in such a way that when you stain it up, it looks like kind of one continuous grain. I'm going to be painting this, so I'm not too worried about it. So, you know, it, that's kind of something that depends on the project that you're building. Another thing to think about if you're doing multiple boards or wider boards is sometimes the end grain is going to have a circular pattern in it, kind of like this one. And if you have boards like that, you're going to want to alternate them you know, up and down the way that the circle rotates across your board. With this little uh, narrow boards like this, it probably isn't going to make too much of a difference though. So the next thing you're going to want to do, which is also probably more important if you're doing multiple boards in a wider piece, is just to dry clamp your boards in place. So you would just put all your boards together and you would actually just clamp them in place, kind of dry clamp them, and check to make sure that all of them are kind of flat this way, they're not cupped, they're not curved, and to make sure that the piece is gonna end up nice and flat when you're done. And then while you've got your boards dry clamped, another good idea, especially if you're doing multiple boards and wider boards, is if you have them dry clamped where you want them, you can mark it. And one way to do that, you can do a V across all of your boards. You would just draw a V like this, and then as you lay them out again with glue, you're going to see that V and line them up. Another way to do it is you can number them. You know, you can put one and then two and then three down your boards. And then when you re-clamp them with glue, you're going to have them in the same order. You know, if you have, happen to be composing grain and so on like that. So now we're going to go ahead and glue up the boards. You're going to want to put a nice bead of glue on both boards. You're going to want to make sure that... It, the board is completely covered so that when you clamp them together you have a bit of squeeze out and you can spread the glue with a brush or a roller but really with, with a small little build like this you can just go ahead and use your finger you can spread it across you're going to want to make sure you get even, even coverage across the whole board when you do this so we'll go ahead and do that with both boards and then we'll go ahead and we'll show you how to glue them up so that they'll be nice and straight and nice and flat. Just like that. So you're going to want a nice flat surface to glue these up on and what you want to do 
is just lay them down and just work them together just a little bit kind of back and forth like this with your hands and that's going to kind of work them really tight together. Then you're going to want to get them just lined up using your lines if you use them. If not, just like I'm going to cut these after I've got it glued together so I'm not too worried about the ends. And they're going to want to go ahead and carefully clamp them up. Just do a, a light clamp on one end, just a light clamp on the other end. And you can use, if you're doing longer boards or like really wide boards or a big build, you'd want to get some nice long bar clamps. But for a little kind of DIY like this, you don't really need that. And as you can see, the glue is starting to squeeze out. That, that's a good thing. That means that you've got good coverage and that the glue is on the entire surface of both sides. So we'll just clamp that up like that and make sure it's nice and flat. And we'll leave that for about 15 minutes. And then by that time, the, the glue will kind of start to gum up and we can just scrape that off with a razor blade or like a putty knife or a chisel or whatever you might have. And if you prefer to get the glue off ahead of time, you can also wipe the glue off with a wet rag. That'll work as well. So I've got my glue uh, wiped off and scraped off. It's been about two hours. After one to two hours with a good wood glue, you can definitely remove your clamps and move on with your project. But it's going to take a full 24 hours for it to totally set. So we'll take the clamps off here and we'll see how we did. I mean, we basically took two really short narrow boards and now we've got a nice wide plank for the project that I'm going to be working on. You know it's really easy, it's really simple. A lot of people are kind of scared to get into gluing up boards like this but it's really not a big deal and if you're just starting out you don't have to work on a whole wide board. Do a couple like three three sets of two and then glue them together. You know whatever whatever your skill level, level is at it, it's not a big deal. It, it's really easy, it's really quick and it, it really kind of raises the horizons of what you can do with you know woodworking and DIY. Today I'm going to show you a little trick called the 3-4-5 triangle or the Pythagorean theorem. It's a little trick that you can use to check almost any corner that you want to be square to make sure that it's 90 degrees. I'm going to show you now. So the theory of this triangle is if you have a triangle that measures 3-4-5 equally in you know any increment of measurements this corner here, the one that's 90, will be exactly 90 degrees. So here I've got a triangle drawn to square that is 3 inches by 4 inches by 5 inches. And as you can see, this corner right here is going to be perfectly 90 degrees. It's a really, really useful tip. I'll show you how you really put it to use right now. So how you would go about using this little technique in real world examples would be, let's say this was a deck you were laying out. So you're trying to get the corner of your deck 90. And you've got one side of the deck fastened down, it can't move. But this side, you haven't started yet, you can still move it. So what you would do is you would measure out, let's say, 3 meters, 3 feet, or you can multiply that, multiply them out to anything. You could do, you know, 6, or you could do 12. So let's say you measure out 3 feet, 3 meters, whichever it's going to be, you mark it. Then what you do is you move this back and forth like that until the measurement of this side of the triangle is 5 or 10 or 15 or however you've gone about it. So you do 3 and then you measure 4 across here, put a mark, you put your tape or string line, whatever it is you're going to use, and you move this in and out like this until this measurement is 10. And then you've got your 3, 4, 5 or you know 6, 8, 10 triangle. And once you've got that, this corner is going to be exactly 90. And of course, the same thing works in metric and in pyro. Like this is a uh, 3, 4, 5 millimeter triangle. You can multiply that out to however big you need it to be. This is a 12, 16, 20 millimeter triangle. And that corner will be 90 degrees. Same with inches. Multiply it out. If, if 3, 4, 5 doesn't work, if it's too small, you need to go bigger because it's a bigger you know, corner that you're trying to get 90. You go 6, 8, 10. You multiply it out however you need to for it to work. And like I said, the key is to move these sides back and forth once you've got your three marked your four marked you move the sides back and forth until this is five that's the key to making this technique work and if you're trying to figure this technique out you know from the beginning do it on paper like i've shown in these diagrams that's really the key the key is going to be to do it on paper first and kind of get it figured out and then use it in kind of real world examples 
So I've got a board here that appears to be about seven and what looks like nine thirty seconds of an inch. Now, if I want to divide this board into even parts, how am I going to go about doing that? How am I going to break down that measurement into fractions and mark that on a tape measure? It's going to be nearly impossible, and I've got an easy way to do that. So what you do is you take your tape measure and you angle it and you pick points. So let's say I want to divide this up into three equal segments. So I pick a number that 3 divides into, so let's say 9. So I take my tape measure, I angle it across like this until 9 inches is right on this edge, and then I can pick 3 and 6. And now I've got 1, 2, 3 perfectly equal segments. And then all you would do is you do that at both ends of your board. So hook that on the end there, you do 3, 6 again, and then you would take your straight edge, or whatever you're going to use, draw those lines along, and they're going to be perfect. So let's say I wanted to divide this board up into seven equal parts, because it was seven and a bit. So I find something that seven divides into, so let's say 14. It's got to be something that you can angle your tape across, so I put this on the edge, put that at 14, and then you just mark it 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. And now you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 perfectly equal marks. Do that at the other end, grab your straight edge, draw your lines down. And the same will work for narrow boards. This board is, you know, it's been rough ripped and it's about like 2 and 5 16, so it's going to be nearly impossible to mark center on that. So I mean, an easy way, the same method, you just angle the cross. You pick something, you want to divide it in half, you pick something that's divisible by 2, so let's say 4. Angle the cross to 4 and mark your line at 2. And the more you angle the tape, the more accurately it's technically going to be, because the more you get away from straight, like if you went 1 to 8 and marked at 4, it would technically be even more accurately centered. The same thing if I wanted to divide this narrow board into three equal parts. So I can go from 1, angle the tape over to 3, mark it at 1 and 2, do that further down the board at 1, and two, then I can grab my my straight edge, or whichever it is I'm going to use, and draw my lines, and you'll see that there it divides the board up perfectly. As you can see, you've got three perfectly equal marks. And the same thing would apply to like a big patio. Let's say this was like a back patio behind your house, and you wanted to divide up marks for whatever reason and it was a really weird width and you wanted it to be perfect you could get a really long tape same thing measure across your patio or your deck or whatever it is do your marks get your straight edge draw your lines and you can lay out anything you can take any width board and you can divide it up into even parts really simply just like that so the first method, and probably my favorite that I like to use, is using cords of a circle, which will end up looking something like this, and I'll go ahead and show you guys just how you do it. So what a cord is, is any point, any line to two points of a circle, and to use this method, all you have to do is draw three lines from point to point anywhere on the circle, and then square in from them to center, and you'll find your center. So this is how you go about doing it. So you've got your circle here, and we go ahead and we draw three lines. We'll do three different length lines just for the fun of it. So I'll go from one inch to six inch. So this will be a five inch line. So we'll do a five inch line like this. Then we'll do, I don't know, let's do a, uh, a four inch line over here. We'll do, so from one inch on the rule. I'm just going to one inch because that gets a nice precise point to work with. So we'll do one inch to five inch there that'll be a four inch line and then over here let's do let's do a three inch line so we'll go from the one to the four inches that'll be a three inch line so the next step is going to be to find center on these lines so this line here was my five inch line so it's going to be two and a half inches uh, this was my four inch line so center is going to be two inches, you put a mark, and this was my three inch line, so the center will be one and a half, and we'll put a mark. 
So the next step will be drawing lines out square or square at 90 degrees from those center points. And you really only need to draw the portion of the line in the center because you're looking for the center of the circle. So you can grab a square, anything that is square, and we'll draw our lines just in the middle because that's really all we need. Uh, you, can, you can actually use a piece of paper as a square too. If you didn't have a square of any kind, you can just grab a piece of paper and you can actually use that as a square. And now as you can see, we've got our three lines right in the middle here. So now you've got your three lines that came out from the center of these. And the intersection of those three lines is going to be the exact center of this circle. It's as simple as that. And this, like I say, this is probably my favorite method using those chords. The next method is going to be drawing a square within your circle and finding the intersection of that. And that's the next way that I'll show you how to find center of a circle. So how you go about doing this method is you're going to want to draw a square within the circle. So what you need for this is an actual square with measurements on it. This is a metric little uh, square. And you have to start kind of moving it around until both points, both measurement points on each side of the square meet the circle at the same time or at the same measurement. So if I move it around just like this, I can go to, it looks like five and a half centimeters. So I'll mark that. And then we'll draw the square out from those. So draw down this way. And you draw it out this way. You could actually just draw the corners of the square because you actually only need to draw the lines across to intersect. And then we'll go ahead and do the same thing on the other side. So this one was five and a half centimeters. So we'll, we'll do the same thing. We'll keep moving this around until both points meet at uh, five and a half centimeters. And it can be kind of finicky to do, but it looks like we're right about right there. So we'll draw that same square. And then what you have to do, if, if your lines didn't quite meet both sides, you just meet up both uh, parts of that square like that. And then what we'll do is we'll draw from corner to corner of the square we just made and the intersection of those two lines will be the exact center of that circle right there. And that's another really easy way to find center of a circle. So the third way is going to be to make a circle template. And what you actually do is whatever circle you're trying to find center of, if you can, trace that circle onto a piece of paper, you cut it out, and then you find center that way. And I'll go ahead and show you how to do that right now. So I've got this circle here. And like I said, all you would do is you would trace that onto another piece of paper. And then we'll go ahead and, and we'll cut that out. So once you've got your circle cut out that's the same size, we'll just take it, we'll fold it in half one way, like this, and then we'll fold it in half again. And then what you do is you take your scissors again and you just snip off just the point, a tiny little bit. Open that circle back up, place it over the circle that you're trying to find center of, and then, as you can see, there's a hole now in the middle of the paper that you cut out. And there you go. Exact center of that circle. How kind of handy is that, eh? And that, you know, that's, that's a neat one to use because you don't need any measurement tools. You don't need any tools or really equipment of any kind. You can do this just with a piece of paper and some scissors. Make sure to check in every Monday, guys, for brand new videos. A lot of really great content that's going to help you DIY woodworkers. And don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and I'll see you guys in the next video.